When I was nine years old, the unthinkable happened. My loving parents decided to uproot preteen me from my cozy elementary school and all of my friends, just imagine the horror, to spend a year in beautiful Northern Italy. So naturally, I stomped my feet. I clenched my hands into itty bitty fists of rage and I glared at my supernaturally patient parents over babyish picture books with titles like Easy Italian for Complete Beginners. But my parents would not be reasoned with. So I said my tearful goodbyes, exchanged a BFF locket or two, and off I went. That plane ride felt like tumbling through a washing machine. I have never been afraid of flying, but I remember being shocked to have arrived completely in one piece, not even a little bit scrambled. I hadn't quite expected to be the very same person on another side of the Atlantic in my new home. Those first few days were way too hot and I was way too tired for anything like culture shock. I did learn that Italian bars are nothing like American bars. They sell coffee and pastry for one, and they don't mind if you wander in unsupervised to buy a lollipop, even if you can barely reach the counter. And I learned that real life people do actually say mamma mia. Otherwise, I was pretty insulated amongst my family in Milan. I clung to English conversation like a security blanket, knowing it would soon disappear because we could not stay in Milan forever. Instead, we boarded a train so heavily graffitied we had to squint to make out the passing fields through the neon windows. And on a muggy Thursday in late summer, we arrived in our ghost town. Ferrara likes to call itself the city of bicycles. And while it is true that you'll see everyone from chain-smoking teenagers to elderly shoppers to businesswomen in shiny heels pedaling through its cobblestone streets, it's mosquitoes that really rule the lands once presided over by the wealthy Este family, whose castle, moat and all, still stands in the town center. On the day we arrived, the castle and its neighbor, the White and Rose Cathedral, were austere. All was blanketed in silence. Soon we would see the piazze bustling and bartering and decked out in colorful scarves at market time. The parks filled with chants and shrieks and murmured invocations for the historic palio and the cafes and their steady morning routine. But we had unknowingly stumbled into a town-wide siesta, so our new home greeted us only in hushed whispers. Ferrara is modern enough that we're not expected to learn the dying local dialect, Ferrarese, but not so touristy that we can coast by on English alone. Italian is unavoidable, especially at school. So the quiet finally shatters on my first day of fourth grade. It is hands down the most cinematic moment of my short life. My 20 odd classmates have been in the same group with the same teacher even for years. So I'm not just the American, I'm also the new kid. I'm a bit too tall, which is a new and completely unexpected problem for me. I'm a bit antsy in my weird school smock. And of course, I'm late. <laughs> for a while, everything sounds a little bit like rushing water. But eventually, almost without my noticing, I adjust. I learn Mediterranean history and photosynthesis and the latest playground gossip. And somewhere in between, I figure out Italian. My teacher is a lifeline. At first, she offers to translate her lectures for me, but she rarely does, and I rarely ask. Instead, she sits with me during English lessons and lets me chat with her. I very quickly discover that my talkativeness knows no linguistic bounds. And she introduces me to poems and stories. I would like to share with you a piece from my favorite Italian children's author, Gianni Rodari. It's about a little boy named Giovannino who ventures through outlandish worlds. Uh, I will read the original text, but a translation is provided on screen for your convenience. Giovannino per di giorno, ha perso il tram di mezzogiorno. Ha perso la voce e l'appetito, ha perso la voglia di alzare un dito. Ha perso il turno, ha perso la quota, ha perso la testa, ma è ravuata. Ha perso le staffe, ha perso l'ombrello, ha perso la chiave del cancello. Ha perso la foglia, ha perso la via. Tutto è perduto, fuorché la lingria. So, I share this piece for a few reasons. First, there's nothing else quite like it. There's nothing exactly analogous to Italian filastrocche in English. 
They're a shade more grown up than our nursery rhymes, a tad cheekier than our odes, and a hint sweeter than our riddles. And there's nothing quite like this little fiastroca and its unmistakably universal message. No other Danny Rodari, no other Giovannino. How is it that Giovannino can be so lost and yet unquestionably happy? In this unassuming poem, Rodari teaches us that it may not be such a paradox after all. It's an elegant conclusion because on some level we already knew. Maybe we just lack the words to articulate the joy common to dizzying new encounters and listless summer days, the mindless peace that is being totally lost. There must then be so many other little truths like this one, just waiting for us to decode them. Isn't it thrilling to imagine that the answers you've been looking for all of your life could really be out there, just in Swahili or Gaelic or Thai? That, to me, is the beauty of language. In a day and age in which we all too often think of other languages as tedious obstacles to commerce or, worse yet, as relics to be swept away in a tide of globalization, I cling to the promise that language learning offers, not just of cultural enrichment, but of personal enlightenment. Second, I share this piece in particular because I see myself, I see nine-year-old Ella in Giovannino. When we arrived in Ferrara, I lost my bearings. I lost my vocabulary. When I stepped into my fourth grade classroom, just about the only things I could reliably say were, hi, my name's Ella, and uh, sidewalk. Only one of which, as you might imagine, was at all useful. I even lost some of my little kid confidence, that combination of too many sugar rushes and an already overactive imagination egged on by my insatiable appetite for books that made me a know-it-all long before I figured out my times tables. Like Giovannino, I was adrift in an unfamiliar world, so I did what he would do, what anyone would do. I leaned in. I wandered. Okay, since my family is here and I'm not sure if they're completely above heckling, I'll admit that I dragged my feet, a little. Maybe I kept my mouth shut for the first few months out of fear of mispronouncing something. I was convinced for a time that I'd mess up an accent here, a verb tense there, and somehow come up with a terrible curse word, with my luck, probably in front of nuns. <laughs> Maybe I pretended to hate the pizza place around the corner from our apartment, because I really hated when my parents would make me call in the takeout order and face the bone-chilling dread of follow-up questions. The point is that I learned to be lost, if only because I had few alternatives, and ultimately I was all the happier for it. During our stay in Italy, we visited Venice several times, as it's only a short train ride from Ferrara. But we never saw what many would call its principal attraction, the Basilica di San Marco. Instead, through sometimes unintentional wandering, we became well acquainted with the spindly stone bridges that crisscross its back alleys with the innumerable artisans of glassware and masks and especially gelato, and with the milling flocks of pigeons in the great church's shadow. Any Venetian scholar worth their salt can tell you that to miss out on the majesty of San Marco not once but four times is a shame, if not a cross-cultural crime. With all due respect, I have few regrets. Checking off every item on your bucket list is also a surefire way to miss out on the mundanities, which let you truly believe in a place and see yourself as part of it. Sometimes it's better to take the side streets. So my takeaway from plunging headfirst into a second language in a brand new country is something like this. Get lost. Muddle through a foreign film. Mispronounce every word in the dictionary. Memorize Inigo Montoya's signature greeting from the Princess Bride in your target language before you know how to properly introduce yourself. I won't pretend that immersion is easy. It's inherently disorienting and frequently terrifying. It's also fun in a way that other, more clinical methods aren't. In the years since my time abroad, I've studied first Greek, then French, then Japanese at three different Delaware schools. And each time, the process was virtually unrecognizable from what I had experienced in Italy. Naturally, complete immersion was impossible. At some point, I had to go home and bicker with my brother in good old English. Still, there was something definitely la lacking in these curricula which nagged at me. After all, how could such rich traditions be reduced to sight words and conjugation tables? Language instruction, as currently practiced in much of the US, is perfectly serviceable. 
It teaches unglamorous necessities, like where is the bathroom, and my cousin's wife's favorite color is brown, you know, the absolute essentials. But such a shallow approach fails to see languages as anything more than tools. And while for us as temporary speakers, they might as well be, other people live in them. They dream and joke and fight and reach out each day in this precious artifact that we so casually borrow and just as easily cast aside. When we just parrot prepackaged phrases, picking up a language because it's convenient, because it's a grade, because we really just need to know where the bathroom is, uh, we buy into something that I call linguistic tourism. It's a superficial highlight reel that fades as quickly as a sunburn. But it works, right? And I truly believe that there is a time and a place for it. We certainly can't explore every nook and cranny of every language. But when we have the opportunity, we can and should go further. Linguistic tourism, which sidesteps art and culture and ingenuity, is not the end-all be-all. Sometimes you have to take the side streets. If we reframe our goals for language learning, leaving aside hollow benchmarks like 100 vocab words or 10 phrases of small talk fodder in favor of the development of mutual respect between teacher and student or foreigner and native speaker, in favor of greater accessibility and integrity in the learning process, in favor of the conservation of that which makes languages beautiful, what are we left with? Not an approach which divorces culture from language, encouraging students to transpose their thoughts literally, rather than inviting them to discover the untranslatable. Not a system which prioritizes memorization over comprehension and the subjective beast that is grammar over expression. Not the classrooms and textbooks which strip away all the loveliness of cadence and humor and nuance. Not linguistic tourism. We're left instead with something more playful. We have, for instance, a new tradition in my household. Each morning, my parents watch a soap opera, Un Po Sal Sole, about a scandal-ridden apart uh, apartment building in Naples. Highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> between that and Italian Wordle, I am actually completely convinced that my mom is well on her way to becoming a high-powered yet street-smart businesswoman in southern Italy. Languages truly open so many doors, right? Uh, and language learning does not have to be practical to be worthwhile. So I urge you to learn a language just to chat with a friend on public transit, to read puzzling foreign books just because you're bored of American tropes, and to rewatch probably clumsily dubbed versions of your favorite childhood blockbusters. You don't have to wait for an international vacation to expand your own world. You just have to learn to be a little bit lost and a little bit free wherever you are. Thank you.